Good day, fellow learners. I'm your mentor, Mentor Ray, and I'm also your fact check buddy. So before we get to start, I'd like to share with you some important things that you may not be able to cover when you're studying for your NTLEX NSAT. So this is an important thing because as they say, every single point counts on the NTLEX. So I'd like to highlight this thing, which I know you may not have focused on during your preparations. So let's begin. So before we get to start, I'd like to ask for your support to join me in this mission. Our goal is to provide free NCLEX RN application and review. 200 nurses who've been doing great so far. Our numbers are increasing. And pretty soon I'm going to post some of our passers and our scholars from this YouTube channel. And it's because of, of your support. So to help us achieve this and continue to do what we're doing, just watch and finish the ads in our videos. That's all I ask for everyone who is watching my videos to please don't skip the ads. Thank you very much for doing so. So remember, this is one thing I'd like to tell you guys, if you have any requests, which you may want me to cover in my future videos, it could be a concept, a question, or even a love life problem. <laughs> okay, You may want to share with me if you're comfortable enough, email it and send it to mentor.raygapus at gmail.com. Of course, I'm not gonna talk about your name when I discuss your love problem. Okay, here's a disclaimer. And here are my pointers on ventilators. So let's begin with my favorite functional concept, which is uniquely RA Gapus. So a functional concept could be a word, a sentence, a phrase that helps you to construct questions on the actual test. So here we go. When checking the ventilator settings, the first parameter to be chosen is the ventilator mode. Also would like to tell you guys that this hospital equipment in which a patient is connected to this equipment through a tube increases the risk for hospital acquired infection. So if it so happen that you have a question that's asking you which client is most at risk to hospital acquired infection, all you have to do is to look for the client who is on a ventilator. Okay, let's move on. So here's another functional concept on modes of ventilation. So you have your volume control mode, which involves the delivery of preset volume of air, and we call that the tidal volume. Now, it is indicated, this mode of ventilation is indicated for clients with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, tidal volume is the amount of air that goes in and out of the lungs with each breath. And approximately, this is 400 to 800 ml. That's the normal amount of air that goes in and out of our lungs with each breath. We also have pressure controlled mode, which involves the delivery of preset pressure to the patient. And this is indicated for neonates who needs, who needs assistance so that their lungs are expanded to its full capacity. Okay? Okay, so let's move on. So there are four basic modes of ventilator setting. We have the assist control or AC mode. It's used for patients who need the most ventilatory support. And these are the clients who are in the intensive care unit. Now, when the AC mode is used, the patient will have a set respiratory rate. So if the ventilator is set at 14 breaths per minute, that's gonna be the respiratory rate that the patient will have. Now in synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or SIMV, so it's used for patients who are post-operative. And in this case, like in a client on assist control mode, the patient will also have a set respiratory rate. The difference is in the SIMV mode, the patient can breathe independently. But remember that during the independent breathing of the patient, the tidal volume will be inhaled by the patient independently. It's not going to be dependent on the machine. Okay, so what's the difference between the AC mode and the SIMV mode? So in the SIMV mode, the patient can breathe independently. What's the similarity between the two? The patient will have a set respiratory rate. Now let's move on to your APRV or airway pressure release ventilation. This is used for acute respiratory distress syndrome or this is used for rescuing a patient who's having respiratory distress. And with this setting, the patient can breathe spontaneously. Of course, that's the patient being assisted by the ventilator. And the pressure support mode which is used for winning a patient from a ventilator. So if the patient's having respiratory 
rehabilitation and if the patient's about to be wind or taken off the ventilator, this is the setting that's done, pressure support mode, okay? Now, but since a patient who is in a pressure support mode have yet to fully recover their breathing ability, there's always a potential that the pressure support mode could lead to poor ventilation and hypoxia and eventually retention of carbon dioxide that increases the risk for respiratory acidosis. So if you'll be asked on the test, which is a potential complication of a client on the pressure support mode ventilator setting, the answer would be respiratory acidosis, or look for the data that says you have an increase in the retention of carbon dioxide. Let's move on. So here's another functional concept. Some ventilator basics, you have to know the concept related to the FiO2, which means fraction of inspired oxygen. This refers to how much oxygen the patient is receiving. So when you say FiO2, it's the amount of oxygen required by the patient to maintain appropriate oxygen levels in the blood. So normally, this should be below 0.5 or below 50%, because if you put this at um, 100%, that could potentially lead to oxygen toxicity. So what is important for you to remember about FiO2 should be maintained below 50% to prevent oxygen toxicity. So if you have an item on the test that's asking you why is it important for the nurse to monitor the FiO2, the answer will be to prevent oxygen toxicity. Now let's move on to PEEP. That's your positive end expiratory pressure. It's the amount of pressure at the alveoli at the end of expiration. And this facilitates gas exchange. The normal pressure would be 5 to 10 centimeter water. And of course, you have the respiratory rate. Okay, it's determined by the physician and it's based on the patient status. The normal is 12 to 18 per minute. So these are the things that I'd like you to remember about ventilators. Okay, now remember this functional concept. Patients with ARDS are placed on ventilators and patients with ARDS are placed on airway pressure release ventilation, the one that is being used for rescuing patients in respiratory distress. That's APRV mode. So airway pressure release ventilation makes the expiratory phase longer than the inspiratory phase to prevent atelectasis. And at the same time, it prevents retention of carbon dioxide. So in essence, it helps prevent respiratory acidosis. Once again, that's your APRV, airway pressure release ventilation. So during this um, mode, uh, in this mode of ventilation, rather the expiratory phase becomes longer than the inspiratory phase. This is to facilitate, once again, the excretion of excess carbon dioxide and the prevention of the collapse of the lungs. That's atelectasis. Okay, now there are two general types of ventilators. You have your positive pressure ventilators, which require an artificial airway like an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. And this type of ventilator is used to force gas into the client's lungs. On the other hand, we also have negative pressure ventilators that encloses the body from the outside, like your hyperbaric oxygen therapy machine. Uh, in this type of ventilators, negative pressure causes the chest wall to expand, which pulls air into the lungs, okay? So I'll show you a picture in a while for you to have an understanding of how a negative pressure ventilator would work. So first, let's focus on a positive pressure ventilator. It promotes lung expansion by delivering oxygen to the lungs. So if oxygen is delivered directly into the lungs, we're talking about positive pressure ventilator, okay? And we have several types of positive pressure ventilators. We have your volume cycle ventilators, as the term implies. It delivers a preset tidal volume. Once again, the normal tidal volume is going to be 400 to 800 ml, then allows passive expiration of the patient. The same tidal volume is delivered regardless of the amount of airway resistance. So this is indicated for clients with acute respiratory distress syndrome and bronchospasm. Okay, once again, that's volume cycle ventilators. It delivers preset tidal volume. The keyword is volume, okay? Next, pressure cycle ventilator. Once again, the keyword pressure. So it delivers gases at preset pressures that allows passive expiration. So the main advantage of your pressure cycle ventilator is that 
it would decrease the risk of lung damage from high inspiratory pressures. Now, this is indicated for neonates who have small lung capacity. So for neonates, um, what is being used would be your pressure cycled ventilator. It's also indicated for those patients that require short-term therapy. Talk about having the need to uh, be connected to a ventilator for less than 24 hours. Okay, then we also have flow cycle ventilators. Once again, the keyword is flow. So it's flow cycle ventilators. It delivers oxygenation until a preset flow rate is achieved during inspiration. Now this is indicated for clients who are spontaneously breathing. Okay, and of course you have your time cycle ventilators that delivers oxygen over a preset time period. So this is usually done, for example, if the patient is sedated and you know you can anticipate for the duration of time in which the patient would need ventilatory assistance. So it's time cycle ventilators that's being used. It's also used for clients who are paralyzed. Okay. So let's move on to the other side of the coin, the negative pressure ventilator that promotes lung expansion by pulling out gas from the chamber where the client is lying. This is what I'm trying to tell you. So this is your hyperbaric oxygen therapy machine. So what happens here is that you create the negative pressure okay, by pulling out air from this enclosed area, okay? And as the air is pulled out, that sucks out, okay? The respiratory muscle, so helping to expand the lungs. And in essence, it allows for the entry of oxygen. So when you talk about exerting the negative pressure from the outside to allow oxygen to enter the lungs, then that's your negative pressure ventilators, okay? So common example would be the iron lung, the drinker respirator, and the chest shell. So negative pressure is created by pulling out gas from the chamber. That's what I'm trying to tell you a while back. So you create a negative pressure. This results to lung expansion, which pulls air into the lungs, okay? So you first have to create a negative pressure within the patient's environment. It's like a suction that would pull out the respiratory muscles and that would allow no oxygen to enter the lungs, okay? So we also have to know about ventilator alarms. For our colleagues taking the NCLEX, please remember this. So the high pressure alarm is due to coughing of the patient or could be related to an obstruction of the endotracheal tube. The priority is to maintain a pattern airway. You can do that by suctioning the client airway. Low pressure alarm, on the other hand, could be due to disconnection or extubation. And the priority is to reconnect or reintubate the patient as necessary. So when the high pressure alarm of a ventilator sounds, what's the priority? suction the client because it indicates obstruction. But when the low pressure alarm of a ventilator sounds, what's the priority? Check for disconnection, extubation, or air leak because that simply means that the patient could be having any of those situations, okay? So let's try to use what we learned in answering a question. Here we go. While providing nursing care to a client on a ventilator, the high pressure alarm sounds. Which of the following interventions is the priority of the nurse? One, reintubate the client as necessary. This is actually an intervention for a client who has been extubated. And when a client is extubated, it's the low pressure alarm that sounds. So that's not the correct answer. We're talking about high pressure alarm in the question. Reconnect any disconnected tubing. Once again, this is for clients who had the low pressure alarm that's um, it's sounding, okay? And then you're left with options three and four. What did we say about FiO2? You have to maintain it at 50% or less to prevent oxygen toxicity. Definitely, FiO2 level of 100% could increase the risk for of the client to develop oxygen toxicity. Therefore, the best answer, since you have the high pressure that's alarming, simply means that there could be pressure buildup. And that happens when there is obstruction in the system, in the airway, or in the tubing of the ventilator. And so therefore, the best answer is number three. 
So it's shout out time once again. Congratulations to our online NCLEX review passer, Abigail e. Rodriguez, one of my bright students from De La Salle Medical and Health Sciences Institute who passed the NCLEX RN last February 8, 2021. Way to go. Now a USRN Abby from NLE to NCLEX. Thank you for the trust and thank you for choosing our, the Ray A. Gapus review system. So once again, here's your mentor, Ray. Also, your fact check buddy was saying a functional concept a day keeps your NCLEX RN fears away. So if you love this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that like and bell notification button so that you'll get notified when we upload videos, which we would usually do twice or thrice a week. Okay. And let's learn together. For more instructional videos, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Gabus Mentors, and my Facebook page, Mentor Ray. So if you have yet to subscribe, join thousands of nurses who've made their dreams come true through our channel. See you there.